an investing episode. It's finally here. Long time coming. It took us about 20 episodes to do this, but this is going to be a crowd favorite. 401ks, IRAs, crypto, real estate. We went through it all. We had Ellie Friedon, Ellie to Ellie. He is the author of Gelt Guide has a great website. We brought him on. We had amazing questions for him and even more amazing answers. We really, really liked what he had to say. You see, people are going crazy. Yes, yes. I think you're gonna like this episode. I loved it. It's a little bit of a longer episode, but people are gonna eat this up. I think we're gonna have Ellie back on in the coming months and years. Really insightful. Without further ado, Ellie Freed. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. Gracing us with his presence, Ellie Freed. Thanks for coming down. My pleasure. Excited so, to be here. Yes, we're very excited to have you. This is an episode that's been a long time coming. We've been reached out uh, to by many, many people saying... We heard this episode, they spoke about investing, what should I invest in, this, that. I said, I don't know, but hopefully we can get people on that have been exposed to the investing world, and um, you have an, a, a great blog I was reading. What's the name of the blog? Gelt Guide. Gelt Guide. Um, when we started Kosher Money, we were like, should it be called Kosher Gelt or what now? We did some Googling, we're like, okay, the Gelt thing is uh, taken, so we're going to do Kosher Money. Um, but let's start with this, the Torah's view on investments. Um, this idea of investing, expending money with the expectation that you're going to turn a profit. Is that idea even mentioned in the Torah? Um, so I would say that Rabbi Lappin did a great job. That's his expertise. He's a rabbi. I'm not, uh, I'm not here in the capacity of rabbi. Um, I do like pointing out, in my view, um, we know the concept of buying low and selling high. And I say that was first mentioned in the Chumash. When Yosef was dealing with the drought, uh, the upcoming famine, Yosef was the one who had this great idea that seemed so out of the box. The power was bowled over that, okay, now when there's an abundance, we're going to put away a lot. That way, when there's a shortage, we're going to have. Why is that such a great idea? Why did you need Yosef to tell you that idea? The answer is, is that human nature is when there's abundance, you think it's going to go on forever. And when there's a difficult time, you think it's going to go on forever. And this is really documented by behavioral economics. Um, It's called recency bias, where everyone thinks whatever's going on now is going to keep going on. Mm. So only a Chacham like Yosef was able to tell Pyre, no, we're going to strategically plan in the good times for the bad times. So I consider that a very interesting um, point of fact where investing and Torah knowledge intersect. The one I think is more important and relevant to practical investing is the famous Gemara. The Gemara talks about diversification, and the Gemara's concept of diversification is misunderstood many times by people who don't really take the time. They don't know the Pirushim. So let's say the Torah is given credit in textbooks as the, the Gemara is given credit for being the origins of diversification. That it says a person should always divide up his property in three, a third should go into land, a third should go into business, and a third should go into uh, into cash, they say, biyad. So you literally see in the textbooks, in the, in the literature, when they go through the origins of, of diversification, they say we have Talmudic diversification. Mm-hmm. But they misunderstand it. But the practical aspect is we as from Jews, when we are investing, we should be tapping into that, and we do know how to read a Rashi, we do know how to read a Marsha, and the Torah has what to tell us about investment advice, and I actually corresponded about this. I wrote a memo to a, 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 a very well-known um, financial journalist explaining what the true meaning of Talmudic diversification was, and he was impressed, and it's something I would like to touch on in the blog, because it's very, very practical. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, Yosef was one of our first biblical investors. I love that. Okay, so there are so many different investment opportunities open to people. We can, and we'll go through uh, quite a few of them in this episode. Each has different levels of risk and reward. But before we get into the different levels or the different uh, investment vehicles, let's talk about 
the value in investing at a young age. People talk about, and in David Bashevkin's episode, he talked about the magic of compounding. Um, how should people fundamentally think about growth and compound? Okay, so, you know, compounding famously has been called the, the eighth wonder of the world. And I use many, I come across many instances that even people who are good at math, good at investing, good at business, they don't really comprehend in their bones how important the concept is and actually how confusing the topic is. So let me challenge you if that's okay. Go ahead. Let's say you were given two different investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. One of them is going to yield 7.5% annually. It's going to grow at 7.5% annually. The other opportunity is you give me your money, and after 10 years, you get back double. You give me 1000 at the end of 10 years, you'll get 2000 mm -hmm. To you, which do you think is the preferable opportunity, the one that's going to grow at 7.5% annually or doubling your money over 10 years? What would you say? 7.5% annually. Okay, so you're an educated person. Right. And you know about compounding, and right. you know that doubling your money over 10 years is not a 10% compounding return. Right? If you can make 100% over 10 years, that's not a 10% compounded return. It's a 10% non-compounded return. Mm -hmm. But at 7.2%, compounding annually, you will double your money So over 10 years. So 7.5% is better. So you have been educated. And Baruch Hashem, you know compounding. I'm a, I'm a reader of Gelt Guide. How okay. can I not be? There you go. There yeah. you go. I'm happy, I'm happy it's making an impact. But there are many, many other instances where people don't really have a, a true depth, in-depth comprehension. They can't imagine how how much. They hear 5% compounded annually. They hear 10% compounded. 10%? That's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. That's not going to do it. I need to make 50%. Right. I need to make 10,000%. So I have mm -hmm. to put my money into, in, you know, into some exotic uh, right, investment. Right. And they probably lose it because that's why it's it's offering mm -hmm. a potential 10,000% return because it's not safe. Right. But the best analogy that I've seen is from Warren Buffett, who's, who's obviously an investment icon. He obviously knows a thing or two about good investment. So he says, think of it as a snowball. I always wanted to say he's a good friend of the podcast, but uh, we're not there yet. Who, Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett, yeah. Well, I have my own interaction with Warren Buffett. <laughs> oh, which, really? Which, uh, we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a separate uh, that's a separate thing. Warren Buffett actually, yeah. his his rebbe in investing was uh -huh. a Jew. Who was that? Ben Graham, Benjamin Graham, uh -huh. the uh, finest book ever written about investments. In Warren Buffett's opinion, is the Intelligent Investor, written by Ben Graham, and there's a lot of interesting anecdotes about Buffett versus Graham, and there's even some some there's a Jewish angle. Should I say it now? Yeah, or go that? ahead, go ahead. Let me so get it's back interesting. To Warren Buffett was the only A plus student Ben Graham ever had in Columbia. Mm -hmm. Um, so after he graduated, Warren Buffett wanted to study by, by his master, by, the, by his mentor. So he asked him for a job because Ben Graham had an investment company. So Ben Graham turned him down, the only A-plus student. And Buffett was shocked. Only A-plus student, why didn't I get a job? So he said discrimination was rampant back then. This was in the 1940s, 1950s. Mm -hmm. And Ben Graham said, he said, you could get a job anywhere on Wall Street. He said, my Jewish students can't. They mm -hmm. won't get hired on Wall Street. So we Jews have to appreciate how much has changed wow. over the past 60, 70 years. We have benefited from rules that prohibit discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just an interesting factoid. And uh, that, that, that he, he, you know, th th there was a Jewish angle to Warren Buffett's career. And actually, Warren Buffett's a friend of Israel. He's invested in Israel. He's donated money to, I think, mm -hmm. Adassa Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a very warm place in his heart for Jews because of the Jewish connection. Maybe you can use your connections with him to... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> to get him onto the podcast, but you've you've actually spoken to him. No, 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 no. I've interacted with the CFO um, over his four hundred one k plans. My primary business is helping companies manage their four hundred one k plans, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I I found some ways that he could improve his four hundred one k plans. Oh wow! Um, and it actually ended up getting mentioned in the Washington Post. Really? And then he was asked about it publicly about the research, and I, I, I mentioned there, Elliot yeah, Fried, yeah. Um, you know, a, a 401k guy says that you should be improving your 401k. Who said that, Warren Buffett? He was, or CFO? No, he was asked. He was oh, asked. he was asked. Okay. Warren Buffett was asked at the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting about the research that I produced about his 401ks. Uh -huh. And he said, yeah, that research is correct, that we should be doing a better job managing the investments in the 401k plan. Wow. But I don't get involved in the nitty-gritty of my day-to-day. -day. I okay. hope my managers do the right thing. So it was just an interesting back and forth. His shareholder meetings on Saturdays, right? Correct. 
So you heard about that Matze shot? What was that like? Yeah, there th- was a recording. There was a recording. I, I, I uh, some of the people in the in the in the financial press knew right. that, that this was my my little project to right. try to get. I was hoping Warren Buffett was going to hire me to fix up his four hundred one k plans. Oh, that's when awesome. that didn't happen, at least I got some good PR out of it. Yeah, um, but, but I, they have been improving it actually. They have been following the. Uh, it was basically about manage, managing the fees. Right. It's a huge, it's a huge pot of money, and they should they need to do better negotiation on their fees. I was reading a book. It's called The Third Door. Basically, how to get in front of influential people mm-hmm. and ask them questions and and pick their brains. And there was this one guy he wanted to ask Warren Buffett. This the author wanted to ask Warren Buffett a question. Yeah. And there's this whole lottery about even if you get into the right. shareholder meeting, there's only about ten people from the crowd that can ask a question. Right. He gamed the system. A fascinating book. Um, but the fact that your question was posed is is brilliant. Uh, but you did bring up Warren Buffett yeah. originally. What did you yeah, want to so say? So Warren Buffett, um, so I, I consider I consider him a mentor of mine as far as investments. You know, I never spoke to him. Probably never will uh, get the opportunity to speak to him. Um, but I've read all his writings. And, and I've been following what he does to try to learn from him. So he has a great gift for explaining investment concepts in a simple manner. It's a fantastic gift. And one of his concepts that he likes using is a snowball. Because everyone remembers when they were kids um, and playing in the snow, especially if you're here in the Northeast, maybe in California it's, it's theoretical. But um, when you have a snowball, it could start out really, really small. As you're rolling it, it gets a little bigger each time. But by the time you're getting to the fifth turnover, the tenth turnover, all of a sudden, from that little snowball, it starts becoming really, really huge. Mm-hmm. So he says compounding is like that. In the beginning, that little snowball, you start rolling, it turns over, you don't really see a great impact on each turn. But if you have a snowball rolling down a hill, and it, each revolution is that much more valuable the first turnover maybe added a centimeter or two centimeters. The tenth turnover can add, you know, an inch or two. And the twentieth turnover can add a foot. So he's saying when you start compounding your snowball, what he the way he puts it is, you need to find good snow and a really long hill. You need to have as many turnovers of your money mm-hmm. in order to get the really valuable compounding at the end. Right? The first couple centimeters on in the beginning of the of those rolls is not nearly as valuable as the cut as the, the rolls later on when down the hill. So when you start young, it gives you the opportunity for that many more turns of the snowball. And that's in a theoretical concept. In the practical concept, people are often amazed, but it's very common. You speak to people in their 50s and 60s. So let's say in the stock market, if they put a small amount of money into stocks, they're very often amazed. They're amazed. They, 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 in the old days, let's say they bought shares. They didn't have the opportunity even to, to, to watch the pricing. Mm-hmm. Unless you bought the Wall Street Journal, uh-huh. you couldn't even see how much it was worth. So you bought 100 shares of Disney. You bought 100 shares of Coke. You bought 100 shares of, of some other quote-unquote blue chip. Mm-hmm. You didn't know how much it was worth. Right. You just put it in a drawer. And then at some point in your 60s, mm-hmm. You, you, you needed some money for, for retirement, or maybe you gifted it to, 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 a, to a child or a grandchild, and all of a sudden you see, wow, you know, I, ma- I made a $1,000 investment, and it's worth $50,000, $100,000. The, the, the compounding of time is, is, is extremely underutilized, uh, and you need, you need more and more of those turns of the snowball to really benefit. Love that. So you mentioned, let's talk about biases. You mentioned the recency bias, which I know I'm a victim of. Um, I was reading uh, some of your work. You also mentioned the survivor bias or the survivorship bias. What is that? Yeah, so that's actually an extremely important um, topic because what survivorship bias means is that um, the analogy given is, let's say, um, this was uh, given by Nassim Taleb, who wrote some very, very, um, they're not easy to read, but they're very uh, important books. Um, The Black Swan is what he's famous for. Uh, and fooled by randomness is more relevant to the investment world. And he says that very often we're fooled by randomness and we mistake black swan events, which means that we don't really understand the, gr- the, the gravity of different effects on our investments or our life in general. So the example, one example of many that he gives of being fooled by misconceptions is when they do a parade after a war, right, and they're marching down Fifth Avenue and you see all these robust soldiers and their beautiful uniforms, their dressed uniforms, and they're all cheering, we're home, we're safe, we're going back to our farms, to, to our loved ones, this and that. War looks glorious. Look at all these healthy, strong, robust people cheering. 
And what's being left unsaid is that these are only the survivors. Left on the, left on the battlefield, left in the graveyards all over Europe or all over wherever the battlefields were, there are many more victims. War is horrible. War is the most horrible thing on this world. It's horrible. But if you're only looking at the survivors, then it could look glamorous. And you have that craziness where every 50, 100 years, the youth of a country or of, or of a continent decide, war is glamorous. Mm -hmm. And let's go in there because, mm -hmm. look, they're all strong. They're all proud. But no. If you look at the entirety of the picture, both the survivors and the non-survivors, then you get a, a, rea a realistic picture. So in investments, you're sending out your money to war. And some people only look to survivors. So the, in, in our terms, it's not a parade down Fifth Avenue. It's a parade down the, down the, down the, down the, the island shul, or it's pounding, pounding yourself on the back in the coffee room and saying, I put money into, into this and this uh, Bitcoin, or I, I bought money, I, I bought Apple stock um, you know, in, 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 in 2000, and look how much money you have, and it's amazing. Or I went into this real estate syndication, and we made, we made a bucket load of money. Okay, great. That's very exciting. Everybody wants to get in. I got to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what's left unsaid? Is that for every one person... Who put money in Apple in 2000? There's 20 or 200 that put money into BlackBerry or put money into GE or many other stocks mm -hmm. that did terribly. Same thing with crypto. Everybody likes coming in to talk about the guy who put money out of 1,000 and now it's worth 50,000 and he became a gazillionaire. But many, many people bought at 60,000 and then it fell to 40 and they panicked and they sold out and they lost 50% of their money in mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important that we don't only look at the survivors. You got to look at the entirety of the package or else you're really not getting a realistic um, a picture of the true risk and reward. And in investing, you can't just look at the potential reward. You got to also include the potential risk. Elon Musk recently shared a tweet, and I'll put that in the show notes as well, about I think it was 50 different biases that we have to be cognizant of to be a better person, both financially and in our personal lives. And it's mind-blowing because we're walking around with so many of this unrealizingly, and we would live more enhanced lives if we were cognizant that these biases existed. So that's really cool. So people reach out all the time, like I said. They want to hear an episode on investment step-by-step step almost about how to get started. Um, I'm sure, and, and this is not something you do one-on-one um, -on -one with people, but if in a, another world someone sat down with you and, and, and said, Ellie, what is your recommendation, not for, as a financial, as a friend, what, what steps do they need to um, do to open an IRA and a 401k? Let's start there. Okay, so it's not in another world. Okay. I'm of this world. Of this world. I, I, <laughs> I get this question all the time right. um, from friends, from family, or people who know me, um, and, and, they, you know, and they ask me, you know, I do want to get started. It's a relatively, relatively small sum of money. I know that's not what you do professionally um, is deal with smaller investors, but still, help me out. So, what, What's that sum of money generally? You just give a ballpark. So, so it's I, like 5000 so, 20000 so, so for me personally, it has nothing to do with, with, with size the of the account. I only focus on, on corporate 401k accounts. But typically, to get a financial advisor um, who's at the... the who's hitting a stride, who already knows the business, it's very hard to get their attention for if you, if you don't have at least 250000 500000 Once you have a million or whatever, you can get a lot of attention. You'll, you can have a line of financial right. advisors ready to and line not, up. And Naftali Horowitz spoke about that where you wanted to polish that thought up in some ways where or you had a differing of, an opinion, and let's talk about that, in that you think that there are financial advisors out there, and maybe Reb Naftali Horowitz would agree after if you've spoken with him, that... There are financial advisors out there that would potentially be recommended at a lower sum. Doesn't mean you need a million dollars to speak to someone or work with someone that's effective, correct? Correct. So I, I, I created a little bit of a hubbub yeah. uh, in response to Naftali's episode, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to Naftali afterwards. And we agree 99.9999% on this topic, so much so that we're trying to work to help people get access to good financial advisors, even at lower sums. What I generally agree with what Naftali is saying, is that it's not easy for somebody with $500 or 5000 even 50000 to get the attention of many financial advisors, because they it's basic business 
concept. You know, you'd rather sell a hundred pallets of uh, you know uh, paper goods than, than than ten pallets or one pallet. So it's simple business economics that once a financial advisor hits a stride and gets experienced and 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 builds his practice, the typical practice is they raise their minimums. But it was just in the wording that, that you know, Naftali said you cannot find a good financial advisor for less. Mm-hmm. And, and Naftali agreed that, that you know, th- that exact wording was something that he, he didn't mean exactly in that way. There are plenty of excellent financial advisors at the lower levels. The challenge is, is that they can't market. They can't market and spend money on marketing to try to get the smaller clients because the marketing itself would, be, would cost more than the, the value they would get out of that. And, and therefore, it's something that actually, you know, Naftali and I have worked together with Living Smarter Jewish, which is a sponsor of the podcast, mm-hmm. to try to help people get, get access. There are plenty of excellent advisors that are growing their careers. But you know what? Just like Yisrael and Moshe is back and forth, not every interaction needs a financial advisor that has 10, 15 years experience. Mm-hmm. If you just want to open up an IRA, which was the initial question, which mm-hmm. we'll get back to, mm-hmm. if you, all you want to do is open up an IRA to put in your $6,000 to get your tax deduction and grow wealth which through compounding could be significant. If you could put away $6,000 a year throughout your career, you're going to have a very healthy retirement mm-hmm. uh, relative to somebody who can't. But you don't need a the most uh, you know sophisticated and experienced financial advisor. That there are excellent people that can service you at the lower levels if the introductions are made, and that's something that can be facilitated on a not for profit way. That that is something that we've been working on, and that's very doable. Would you say it has to? Be, and just to interject, would would you say it has to be a person necessarily that's facilitating the six thousand dollars a year, or in twenty twenty one December? There are even websites and, and videos that one can watch to figure out what to do on this lower level. So, so that's something I also agree with Naftali very strongly on, mm-hmm. is that investing has become unbelievably simplified. You can literally put money into a fantastic single mutual fund, um, whether it's a target date fund, which is typically used for retirement, but you could also use it for Simchas, which I've, I've written about. Um, there's something called an asset allocation fund. It's an all-in-one fund. Vanguard has a suite of them. iShares has a suite of them. For 0.14%, they will take your money. All you have to do is say, do you want an aggressive growth portfolio? Do you want a moderate growth portfolio or conservative growth portfolio? You give them the money. You, 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 you know, wire them the money, whatever it is, and that's it. You can forget about it. You can forget about it for 20 years, for 30 years. You're getting some of the best management skills for a tiny fraction of money with one decision, and that's very, very doable. Now, you have to educate yourself a little bit. Self-education is good for everybody. I mean, even if you're going to hire a financial advisor, I believe, you got to self-educate it. Like, uh, I think it was Sims, the clothing store. I don't know if it was around when... when uh, Vaguely. In, in your times. But uh, for the old time, it was like us. They, their slogan was, an educated consumer is our best customer. you got to be an educated consumer. I don't care if you have 5,000 to invest or 500,000 or 500 million. You have to be able to evaluate the people you're doing business with. Do they know what they're doing? Are they going to look out for my interests, etc.? you got to know the 101. The 101 is, thankfully, relatively easy. You read one book, two books, three books over your time. You don't have to crash course. Mm-hmm. Eventually, easy way in. You read a couple of books, you read a couple of articles. You got to speak to unbiased people. Mm-hmm. You got to speak un- to knowledgeable people, and you got to speak to ethical people. But there are plenty of those, and you can get self-educated, do a great job. So let me get back to your primary question, which is so important. It's very easy today. You could, you could online. You go to you go to you go to Fidelity. Investments, which is a multi-trillion dollar company, fantastic customer service. I opened my first Fidelity account um, when I was a bucher. Um, can I show you something from, yes, the, from the Smithsonian? Yes, yes, from the museum, so brought we, out we, we dug for those we watching. We dug this out of the archive. Yes. This is my first book. Um, tape bound. About investing. Tape bound, so, so wrinkled it cover. So still has a tape. And at the time, it was new. This was printed in 1996. 1990, investing for Dummies. Investing for Dummies. So this was my first investment book. I w- had just graduated high school, and I mentioned to my mother that I wanted to get into investing. Okay. Um, I was like a side hobby. And um, she bought me this book, and thankfully, it's beyond Hashem that this book is excellent. The author, is, his name is Eric Tyson, mm-hmm. and he has a whole series of 
such kind of books. He has investing for dummies. He has personal finance for dummies. He has real estate for dummies. And I hope no one gets insulted no, I, I when think I recommend a, a dummies book. No, a lot of people <laughs> have um, self-admittedly told me they are dummies and they want books and content like this so that they can better understand the, the basics so that when they speak to someone or do some research online, they're actually educated. So that is an example. You know, I, I recommend the books because I love the books. I bought actually... Um, when new editions uh, came out, I bought the new editions. I use the new editions. You should not buy. Go, don't go to eBay and buy the 1996 version. Right. A lot has changed over the past 25 years. But that's an example. You read one or two of Eric's books, maybe one or two other books, you will know more than 85% of the population about investing in finance. It's not that difficult anymore. There's not brain surgery. It is. You really can cover. 75 to 95% of the normal person's needs, you can self-educate. Now, some people don't want to self-educate. They're busy or they're intimidated, which is fine. So they need a financial advisor. Sometimes, like we mentioned yesterday, sometimes something davar kasha, something difficult arises. It doesn't have to be davar gadol, mm -hmm. meaning sometimes it's a relatively small sum of money, but, mm -hmm. it's, but it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Then you have a dilemma. Because of a small sum of money, you're not going to go hire a professional for thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a dilemma. And that's where I do think there's a role for Living Smart Jewish, for example, to say, okay, we can't tell you who to hire, but here's a list of financial advisors that we have heard do a good job, mm -hmm. and they're willing to take smaller clients. It doesn't mean they're not good at what they do, but they have some capacity. They'd rather use that capacity for a smaller client mm -hmm. than, have, than, than not use up that capacity. Right. They have X amount of, of, of spaces available, and they'll use it. They do a great job. So getting back to once you are self-educated, or even if you're not, go to Fidelity Investments. In 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you can up, open up an IRA account. What's What freezes me when I hear that is that I think – and I'm, I'm projecting my feelings on the cloud, which is another bias that we have that <laughs> someone once told me, Ellie, you're projecting your feelings on, on everyone's. And it's just because you feel this way doesn't mean everyone does. But the way I feel is if I were to sign up on Fidelity, I'm sure, like you said, I would get and, and, and did an aggressive plan for someone in their 20s and 30s. I'm sure I would get a good return uh, or, or they have a good strategy, let's say. But is it the best strategy? I want to, I want, it's me. I, wa I want to make sure I'm getting the best. So I'm not going to do anything until I can find a financial advisor that can tell me I'm getting the best. I don't want Fidelity's customer service to tell me this is what they think the best plan is. It's someone on another side of the, of the world, potentially. That's, that's the holdup I have in stopping me from possibly doing something that I, I should be doing. So, so I hear what you're saying. And I, I, I I don't know if that's just holding other people back. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, because I, I do speak to people yeah, yeah. at all different income levels um, that I come across. I think a lot of it is just lack of knowledge and and, mm -hmm. and, and intimidation and, and just you, you don't know what to do. So paralysis analysis, you just do nothing. Uh -huh. um, I, I would like, let, let's put that on the side okay. for a second. Okay. Let me finish what I think people should do. Okay. And then we'll talk about, hey, is that the best? We're, we're going to come back this to your question. Free, I'm getting a free session here with Ellie Freed. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> this is great. Everyone should open a podcast. If you need financial advice, open a podcast. And in episode 18, 19, when Ellie Freed comes on, it's free. It's genius. Okay. Thank, th thanks, Ellie. That's, that's all I need. Um, but... <laughs> Go to Fidelity, open up an IRA account. If your accountant is telling you to put money into an IRA, then obviously you need an IRA account. Open up an IRA account. It literally will take you 10 minutes. And then the question becomes, okay, if you don't choose an investment, it will just go to, to a money market fund, which is basically like a cash account, which is not the end of the world. For You, you don't have to panic. If your money's sitting in cash until you figure out what to do with it, it's not the end of the world. Now, you shouldn't leave it there in cash for 40 years until you retire because right. inflation will eat that up. But... The good news is, like I mentioned, you can choose. Fidelity has excellent target date index retirement funds. Where basically, they're saying, look, the typical retirement investor, now you're 30 years old, you're not going to think about this money for 35 years. We're going to invest this whole pot accordingly, which means right now we're going to put it into a high growth strategy because you have 30, 40 years to grow this money. So... Anything that happens to the stock market in the interim of, over those 30 years, we're going to grow right through it. As long as you don't panic and pull out, we're going to grow, grow right through it. So you could just put it in there. Literally, it's designed, set, and forget. You could set up an automation. 
You don't have to do the six thousand dollars at once. If you could, one year you could do six thousand. Next year you could only afford two thousand. Maybe next year you want to do twelve thousand. So you open, you do six thousand for you, six thousand for a spouse. By the way, it's important to, to do both. They're, 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 maximize. They're, you know, it's it's it's. You can maximize it, but even if you put it in six, you may want to do half and half because life is different, ages are different, and each IRA is for the individual. So it's important to to, to remember that. But you open up the IRA. You can choose a target date fund. Um, Vanguard and iShares have something called asset allocation, which I mentioned, that if you don't want to do this target-based investing, they just have risk-based investing, where you could choose an aggressive option, which is going to be 80% in stocks and 20% in bonds. You could can choose a moderate growth investment, which is going to be 60% bonds, 40% stocks, and that's it. You can automate the deposits every month. $50 goes out of my account. Or five hundred dollars, or five thousand dollars. It's a beautiful thing. You could switch the level of aggressiveness as you go. And yeah, you well. So that's where it gets dicey. We're technically yes, you could change at any time. But but if you put money into aggressive, right, and then it grew, and now you want to switch the whole pot to less aggressive, mm-hmm. you're gonna have a tax issue. Mm-hmm. Now in an IRA, you're not gonna have a tax issue. So yes, you can just say, okay, it was aggressive. I feel like it's too aggressive. When the market fell. It hurt me. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to wait till it comes back, and then I'm going to switch to a lower level. Mm-hmm. 100%. You can do that. Mm-hmm. It happens to be these companies today, a lot of them have excellent customer service. Fidelity is very good customer service. They have an 800 number. So if you say, my favorite podcast recommended, I go into the target date index fund that corresponds to my age, but I can't find it. They will help you find it. They're not mm-hmm. going to pick an investment for you because that you need to be a licensed financial advisor. They're not going to give you that advice. They're just acting as your portal. They're not actually your personal financial advisor. Mm-hmm. But if you know what you want to buy and you just don't know how to find it on their site, they will help you do that. So you can do that. So this is the thing. First, you got to save the money. That's the real hard part for most people. Then you automate the deposits into the account. You automate the deposits from your cash holding account at Fidelity into the investment and then forget about it. And then forget about it. Don't try to outsmart the market. Monthly automation? You could do monthly. You could do whatever you want. That's I would imagine beauty. that's a little bit more digestible for people that's than an beauty. annual bulk sum of that's money. That's the beauty, Ellie. The mm-hmm. beauty is that it's, they made it so simple today. You, they'll let you do every other month whatever you want, whatever you want. The real hard part today is behavioral. Mm. That's why you mentioned Dave Ramsey on, on, on your prior podcast. He has a good line, which is true. It's 80%... In your in your brain and your behavior, eighty percent is your behavior, and only a small percent is in the actual knowledge. The actual knowing what to do is not the hard part. It's what you mentioned is part of it. Is the FOMO? Oh, I come into shul, and this guy, the survivor, by the way, the survivor tells me that if I that he bought this in this stock, and why would you go into a mutual fund that on average has only made you know eight percent compounded or ten percent compounded? They actually been doing amazing lately. Mm-hmm. Um, I can just mention, just so people don't... Yeah. And for those listening, we are in December 2021 at the time of recording. So if my kids are listening in the year 2041, <laughs> uh, it gives them yeah. context. But, but, but you know, these type of funds that we're mentioning, so let's say the, 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 the uh, growth fund that I mentioned, you put it in there, it's a growth fund, you put it in there, you can forget about it. It made over the past 10 years 11.1% compounded annually. That's pretty good for an investment that you didn't need any special protect to you. The, 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 you. You could put in almost any dollar amount. You can automate it. You could do it in a tax-friendly manner within the IRA. That's fantastic. That's fantastic that without any fight, without any, without, uh, without any hard work, without it, w- worrying that maybe the guy's a scam or maybe the guy's going to have a heart attack and then what happens to your uh, real estate syndication or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever happened. So that's over the past 10 years. Now, admittedly, the past couple of years have been fantastic. So it's not necessarily something you can count on. But these funds have been open since 1995. Mm-hmm. We're talking about over a 25-year track record. And the growth fund has made 8.65% compounded an- annually. I feel that is fantastic, considering it was a no-brainer investment. You made one decision. The fees involved were, were, were minuscule. You didn't need any special endeavors, any anything. It's for anybody. You put in, so Vanguard happens to have a, a $3,000 minimum. The Archer's product, you could buy, the Archer's product, no minimum. You could buy it on Robinhood. You could put in $5 a month if you want. Mm-hmm. Today, the barriers to be 
a solid investor is, is zero. Zero. There's no reason why anybody is not investing in an automated, simplified fashion, except what you're saying, that people are confused. People are confused by survivorship bias. You're also confused by people selling different products. Mm-hmm. Right? These products make very, very little money for middlemen. That's part of the beauty. Now, you got to remember, if you're a middleman, right, there's a trick in, in the industry, which I'm part of. You know, I'm not trying to imply that, you know, that, that, that people are doing anything untoward. But when my industry says, the financial industry says, we're going to charge you just 1%. Right? So 1% sounds very small. Right? Okay, I get 99. You get 1. But here's the trick. 1% is of the whole pot. But we're thinking about the wrong number. Because let's say you have a pot with $100,000 in it, right? And you're hoping to grow it by 10% a year. When we talk about 1% of the whole pot, it's 10% of the whole growth. So you're giving away 10% of profits. And if you're giving away 10% of profits, what that does to compounding, because of the compounding effect, giving away 10% of profits doesn't hurt your returns only by 10%. Over 30, 40 years, you know what that does? Mm -hmm. It slows down the snowball. Mm -hmm. So you're going to miss one or two of those very, very valuable turns at the end of your investment career. So giving up an extra percent that you didn't have to can cost you 25% of your future returns. Now, fees could be worth it. If you're not going to invest without paying a financial advisor, then pay a financial advisor. It actually opens up a whole other conversation, which is, okay, do I need a financial advisor? And what value do they provide? I read my mind. That was my next question. So that's a great question. And today, because great investment options are available over the counter, let's call it, most people don't need a financial advisor for investing. The, a financial advisor, first of all, it helps that if you're busy, you're intimidated, you're confused, to avoid making a mistake is very valuable. Meaning if, if you will end up in the wrong investment for 30, 40 years, and you were so worried about paying your financial advisor, but you ended up in the wrong investment, then you made a very bad trade-off. You were worried about pennies, but you gave up not dollars, you gave up many, many thousands of dollars. So some people, they're busy. The same way, I don't, I don't change the oil in my car, and people pay for landscapers, and people pay for sheitelmachers, and people pay car dealers, right? People don't go to the auction. You pay a car dealer. Yeah, I know the car dealer is making money. I'm very happy for him to make money because I have a life. Mm-hmm. You know, I have, a bu- I have my own business. I have my own parnasa. I'm not looking to, to, to stop someone else to parnasa. Let him make parnasa. But that being said, you should be an educated consumer and know what you're getting. Sometimes financial advisor is not adding value. If all your financial advisor is doing is dumping you in the same mutual fund that you could have found on your own, then he's not adding value. Oh, where's the value? A lot of value beyond just lack of knowledge is in planning. I get all the time. I got one on the way here. Mm-hmm. A guy, a guy, a guy texted me. I pulled over. Don't worry. Um, a guy says, "Ellie, do you know I need tax advice?" I said, "What about your accountant?" Oh, my accountant's not giving me ta- proactive tax advice. He's just doing a tax return for me. The value that a financial advisor very often brings is in the proactive planning, in tax structuring. That's a whole nother conversation. If you don't invest tax efficiently. You will, will be giving you will be giving away twenty five to fifty percent mm. of the growth. I feel the biggest value add, and where people should be putting most of their attention in investing, is not in trying to come up with the super duper duper investments. Because you know what, you're probably not going to find it unless you put in a lot a lot of time, unless it basically basically becomes a part time job. So uh, we're jumping around, but the, getting back to your question about the best, the best, the best. I don't believe you're going to find the best just in that three-minute conversation you're going to have in the coffee room. If it was that easy to find a great investment, we would all be billionaires. Mm -hmm. It's not that easy. Think about it. It's not that easy. And there's tremendous amounts of data on this. So, for example, the mutual funds that hire great professionals to pick stocks, right? So they take a category. We're only going to pick stocks within small U.S. companies. Right? And they pay a lot of money to their money managers. These are money managers that went to the best schools and they got the CFAs and got the best training. They have all the Bloombergs and all the data and all the back testing and, and, and the unbelievable amount of data and training. Not, not a coffee room education. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Which, which, which has a lot of value. But that's that's <laughs> right. a separate conversation. Um, the facts of the matter are is they struggle to get outstanding investment returns. 
If you even look at the investment greats, the investment greats, right? Warren Buffett is a great investor because he has a very long track record of making 20% of his money. You could be on a top 100 list. Somebody who, who, who made 15% on their money for decades, he's literally on a top level list. It's not that easy. Most of what we see about people who are really hitting grand slams is one of two things. Either it's survivor or bias. It's someone who he can't hit consistent grand slams. Right now, he's hitting grand slams. And when the market turns, he's going to lose it all. This happened to me. I actually wrote an article about it because of what happened. Regular guy I know, a friend of mine, he came over to me. He says, Ellie, um, I'm thinking about quitting my job. This was, uh, I don't know, 18 months ago. Uh-huh. I think it was before COVID. Um, I want to quit my job. Quit your job. You have, a, you have a family. You have a wife. You have kids. How are you going to pay the bills? He says, well, I've been trading on Robinhood. And I made a tremendous profit. I used a couple thousand dollars, and I made a 50% return in no time. So I'm clearly a great stock trader. So I, I want to quit my job, and I'm going to make my money trading stocks. So I said, look, if you're an amazing stock trader, I did, I'm a little bit surprised, because I never knew you that way. You're, you're, that's totally not your job. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't believe he had any great insight on the stock market. More likely is he had a... He, he, he decided, you know what, let me jump into Tesla. That's, that, that's not a brilliant investment insight mm-hmm. backed by tremendous research and conviction and this and that. He happened to jump into Tesla. Maybe he made two, three such guesses based on what he heard in Shul, what he saw in a magazine or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And these two, three stocks did extremely well. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to keep it up. So it happens to be, I happened to meet him recently, and he told me that he really needs my help. He wants to make a crypto investment. Mm. It's some esoteric crypto that Robinhood won't even let him buy. That's how esoteric it is. And Coinbase, the regular tr- uh, trading platforms won't let him buy because it it's really, really exotic. He wants to put in some money because he's in debt and he wants to use the, the profits to help him get out of debt. So I didn't say anything, but he volunteered to me. He didn't even remember the prior conversation. He just said, yeah, I lost a lot of money trading stocks, so I got to do something else. Mm. So I didn't rub it in his face. I held my tongue and he had forgotten uh, he'll probably remember now because here on the podcast. Um, but this is an example. This is an example of somebody who didn't have skill. Mm-hmm. He confused a little bit of luck for skill. Mm-hmm. Baruch Hashem, he didn't lose a tremendous sum. He lost a couple thousand dollars. To him, that, it is a tremendous sum. Mm-hmm. Um, Quit his job? Did he end up quitting his job? Baruch Hashem not. Okay, good. Baruch Hashem not. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's basically making ends meet, but he's short that little bit. Right. Getting back to the... Grand Slam investments. I believe, for the most part, either either it's pure luck and it, your luck is going to run out. Mm-hmm. Or it's people that really do have some kind of superior insight, which doesn't come in even a couple hours a week. It's something you really have to put yourself into. Now, of course, of course, if you want to become a stock trader, I think real estate is much easier than stocks. I tell people, if you have a job on the side, you, you want to make more money, yeah, spend every Sunday, spend half a day every Sunday getting to know a market, Look at hundred every single property that comes on the market in a certain neighborhood. Look and look and look and look and look. Sooner or later, there's a fair chance you'll find a property that's undervalued, and you may make fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars trading that one property. But then you're a professional. Then you're you're, you're a quasi professional. Mm-hmm. You're spending a lot of time. So you have your your main job that pays your bills is whatever. You're, you're managing a warehouse. You're a doctor. You're a lawyer. Whatever it is, it's not important. And then you have a side job. You have a side job as an investor. We Jews tend to be very good at investing. We tend to be extremely good at real estate investing. If you want to have a side hobby real estate investing, great. But don't assume that it's something that's just going to come from a quick conversation and a little bit of research. You're going to lose your money. You're going to lose right. your money. So that's why I believe it's, it's, for, it's, it's, it's you're chasing a, 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 false, a false god. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not reality. Very and interesting. I don't believe in that. I believe the average investor who has a full-time job and it just investing means you're putting your money beyond your job. You earned your money. You have extra money because you saved. You put those savings into an investment, which means your money is working for you. Once you have to put in tremendous amounts of time to find the investment, manage the investment, you have another job, which is great. Investments could be a great industry. I'm in the investment industry. But don't think that that's an investment. That's your business now. You have a side job. So don't confuse it. Don't think you're going to be great as an investment professional if you're not putting in the time. If you're not an investment professional, stick to the simple. 
You mentioned IRAs briefly. I want to touch on 401ks, which are primarily employee-sponsored, right? For those listening, should people be cashing in on whatever employee match, that employer match that they can get? Um, how, how should someone think about it? Because not everyone is in a company that has a 401k plan, but those fortunate to have it, um, I'm imagining some people aren't taking advantage of it. They don't have it. And there are those that say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing 1% match. I'm not doing up to the 4%. Right. How do you look at that? Okay, so first, in full disclosure, this is my this is my panosa, right? Is four hundred one k. So so I like four hundred one k's, and I think it's fantastic, and I think every company should have one. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm kidding, <laughs> but uh, just just for full disclosure, yeah. um, the vast majority of America that does have access to a four hundred one k, the majority of which is which is the majority. It's not everybody, but let's say all the lar- virtually all the large companies offer them, and most people use them because they want that match. Most people know free money is free money, and for going. Typically, it's about 3% of salary. It could be as much as 5 or even 10% of salary. But for going, a 3% bonus every single year throughout your career is obviously giving up a tremendous amount of money, especially if that money could be invested tax-sheltered in a, in a, you know, within a 401k as a tax-sheltered vehicle, especially if it could be invested in a target date fund or some other great fund. So for sure, it's a, ter- it's, it, it, it's a terrible waste to give up a match. Now, the, 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 the caveat is the company v- typically doesn't just give you the 3%. Mm-hmm. They want to encourage savings. Um, so they'll say, if you put in 3%, we'll also put in 3%. More typically, you put in 6% of your salary. We're going to, on top of that, put in, as a bonus, savings. We're going to put another 3%. That's just the employer being nice? Is well, that- it's part of the package. It's part of the package. Employers want their employees to feel they have a financial future. Mm-hmm. And they know it's very hard to save. Most people spend whatever they earn. No matter if they're earning 20000 50000 or 500000 the typical American structure whether in our world, of the Orthodox Jewish world, or beyond. The typical is people have expenses. As their incomes grow, they tend to let their expenses grow, which is a problem, but that's, that's reality. So a 401k, for most people, beyond their house, most Americans, and I believe most from people, the majority from people, their savings very often is a retirement issue. Now, the firm world is a little bit different because, first of all, we have tuition. So we do have a very large added expense that the typical American doesn't have. So it's very possible that we have certain financial pressures that put us in a different category. But even beyond that, even somebody who is ready to save, should you save it in a 401k? Here's the issue. We have simchas. So I, I go like this. First, you've got to pay your bills, your, your basic bills, your, 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 your roof over your head, food, clothing, and tuition, which for us is, is, is a necessity. Then, if you have any credit card debt, which is burning through, through a hole in your pocket at 18, 20, percent you got to get rid of that because that's like financial cancer. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to grow any wealth if the clock is running the other way. So you got to get rid of that. That's like an emergency. The next most valuable thing you could do with your money is get that match because it's basically like a guaranteed 50% return at no risk. So that is going to be your best deal. But we from families have simchas. We have simchas. It's also, it's very difficult. If you don't buy a house, it's very difficult for us to uproot ourselves and move to an entirely different area. Um, we do have, generally, we, we need to have a shul. We need to have schools for our children. We tend to have large, in, very tightly knit families. It's very, very hard for us to uproot ourselves. So what happens is if you don't buy, and because of the nature of the compound, the, the, the physical compounding of our families, Prices tend to rise very, very quickly and dramatically in firm communities. Mm-hmm. So if you don't lock in the price of housing, very often you end up being priced out. So that's one of the main reasons why buying a house for a firm family is a very important financial need. I'm not saying you have to do it right after you get married. I'm not saying you shouldn't build up a down payment. You definitely should know where you want to live. You definitely should have some inkling of how much money you're going to be earning. So, you know, we get this question. I get it very often, you know, in Lakewood, which is the, you know, the home of the largest cattle in, in America, maybe the world. 
if you don't know what your income is going to be, you have no clue. You're in Kyle now. You, you don't even know what, what, what industry. You, you, you have no clue what your income is going to be. It's very hard to make such a large financial commitment. Maybe you don't even want to stay here. Even if a guy tells me, I want to be in Clay Kaitish. For sure in Lakewood. Maybe you want to you get a, become a rabbi in Atlanta. Or maybe you'll open up a shul in, uh, I don't know, in, in Wisconsin somewhere. So that, that commitment to a house is, is tenuous when you're so early in your family life and your financial life. But even so, I do believe it's important for most, once a firm family has some inkling where they want to settle and what their, some inkling when the, what their financial future is, I do believe they should buy a house. So I, I believe that that is a priority before retirement. Retirement is a very, very long, 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 long time away. Mm-hmm. I'm reluctant to give up the match, though. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um... But retirement is very, you should try to get that match. There's no question. There's also Simchas. I've got to mention. The next yeah. thing after house is saving for Simchas. So a retirement is a multi million dollar burden. But Simchas could be, a, depending on your family size and depending on what you intend, if you're not doing a COVID backyard wedding with right. 10 people and uh, some streamers. Um, which is beautiful. Which is beautiful and wonderful. But if that's not your intention, right. then you got to save up for that too. So you can't tie up too much money in your retirement right. accounts. Right. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned real estate. That's going to be controversial, by the way. Which one? This thing about retirement. Retirement. Yeah, no, we, we like <laughs> controversy. The numbers jump when now. Um, you mentioned real estate, um, people looking at the market as an example, um, picking up a house, flipping it. Um, real estate is a huge Jewish business. Every guy and his brother-in-law seems to be in real estate, syndicating deals, how does that all work? There are a lot of people that, and, and up until a few weeks ago, I didn't really have even a basic understanding. Someone says, you know, you should get into it. I wouldn't even, I, I didn't know who to call. What do I do? What does that mean? Um, how does it work? And how does someone know if it actually is a good deal? Okay, so I'm going to tell you one of my favorite um, video clips of all time. It's available on YouTube. Okay. Of, is Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's partner. He's a billionaire in his own right. Uh, considered to be a very, very bright fellow. He was asked, and he's at a point where he's not politi- politically correct anymore. He's like in his 90s. We like those and he, people. And, and he's a billionaire, and he just really couldn't care less what people <laughs> think about him. So he was asked in some kind of investment setting, why do you favor stocks so much over real estate? He has real estate investments, but he's famous for investing in the stock market. So he said, I don't want to compete in a field where other people have more advantage than I have. And he said, real estate is industry heavily favored by certain, um, certain groups. And he spe- he, among that group, he specified Hasidic Jews. And he said, they're very good at it. And they know all the deals. Hmm. They hear about the deals before I hear about the deals. And I don't want to compete with them. So this just blew my mind that here we have one of the best connected uh, multi-billionaires. And he's saying that the idol knows they know what they're doing. The guys from Lakewood, from Brooklyn, from Far Rockaway, wherever they're from, uh, Baruch Hashem, we're good at it. I love that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have uh, Jews on their radar. Well, right. like I said, like yeah. I said, the Warren Buffett, Munger very likely got it through Buffett because the mm-hmm. Midwesterners in Omaha, Nebraska, or actually uh, Munger is from, from California, mm-hmm. so I don't know his uh, connection. Anyway, there's definitely a Jewish connection there. Mm-hmm. Um, getting back to your question, we're good at it. It doesn't mean everyone's good at it. It doesn't mean that no matter what you do in real estate, you're going to make money. It doesn't mean that your brother-in-law or your, um, your, col- your, 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 your acquaintance who pitches a deal at you, it doesn't mean it's automatically a good deal. So let's take a step back. Most of us, most Americans, end up being investors in real estate because we buy a house. A house is a piece of real estate. People forget that. Not only is a house a piece of real estate, the best financing on the planet, the best mortgage financing on the planet, is made available to almost every single American. It's an amazing mortgage. If you can lock in a mortgage for 30 years, and they'll help you if you can't afford the down payment. They try to help you with that. And if you see now during COVID, if you couldn't pay your mortgage, okay, we'll do a moratorium. You could do a you could do a uh, you know a recapitalization. We'll renegotiate. It's an amazing opportunity to invest in real estate for everybody, and it's in the numbers for most Americans. Their home is their greatest investment, and that's good. There's an this article in the Wall Street Journal talking about how bad how real how, how buying a house is not a good investment. And I said, you're missing numbers here. 
And he, he admitted to me. It was an v- email exchange, and I have the email. Mm-hmm. He admitted he simply is missing, he was missing the rental value of the house, which in that case, you know, uh, it's not important, the details. But he was moida, mm-hmm. that the yeshiva guy from Lakewood kn- kn- knew something about real estate that he, he's a big professor and a, re- and a Wall Street Journal reporter, missed. So that itself is very valuable. It's I'm scared one, to write an article. I know I'm going to... If I ever write an article, I know that Ellie Fried's perusing it. But it's great that you're actually not necessarily calling them out, but but you're providing them data or insights that they didn't have. Very respectfully. I simply explained to him that he was missing a certain aspect. Uh, He had data, but the data didn't reflect the reality. So buying a home is very important. And Ellie, you're saying you don't know about real estate. Do Mm -hmm. you own a home? I do own a home. You own a home? So you're ready, real estate investor. Mazel oh, tov. Thank you. I'm going to get a plaque. <laughs> now, I believe if somebody wants to go beyond his own house, I think it's an excellent opportunity to expand your investment further because you already know what it means to research a house. You already know what it means to maintain a house. You know you're going to need a lawyer. You're going to need, a, uh, you're gonna need a, uh, you know, someone to help you with the mortgage. All you have to do then, it's not all. I'm putting the all in quotations, but you're going to have to rent it out. But even that, if you look at a piece of property in an area that you know somewhat, maybe you work there, maybe you vacation there, maybe it's on the outskirts of your town, so it's not in the, in the heat of the pricing, you know, you go, you know, a, a couple of towns over, but you have a general sense of the market, that could be an excellent opportunity to expand be- beyond your first real estate investment in a way that's measured, it's controlled, and you could use that amazing financing mm-hmm. that's much better the financing of a 30-year mortgage, in many ways, is much better than the financing that the syndicators can get. Because the syndicators, at most, they can lock in 10 years. Maybe they could get 30-year financing, but none of them are. Mm-hmm. So there's a tremendous protective value in a 30-year mortgage where you know you know what's going on. Your, your debt is locked in. Mm-hmm. Happens to be on an inflation basis. I know inflation is going to be a topic that's going to come up. Mm-hmm. But without getting into a whole inflation conversation, I consider the best inflation investment – Residential real estate financed with a 30-year mortgage. Now, obviously, if you buy a bad house in a bad area, then it's not going to help you. Right. But if you buy a solid house in a solid area, even if you're paying somewhat of a premium, but as long as you can make your mortgage, you don't do anything too crazy, if the, if, if the dollars are inflated, you're paying the bank back in, in, in dollars that are becoming worth, and worth, worth less and less and less. Right. So the house will go up in value. The rents will go up with inflation. So you're using that rental income to pay off a mortgage, so the mortgage is locked in. Your rental income is not locked in. I could see you <coughs> I could see you talk to people about this for a living because all of your all of your scenarios are followed up with examples or you know, all the terms where all my all my questions to my guests are, can you explain that? But I never even get to that point because you're like, for example, here's a okay, case. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so real estate, aha, that's interesting because when I hear real estate or deals, you know, people say you need to have tremendous liquidity to get in on a huge apartment building complex. But to get in on real estate, like you said, can be a measured lower tier investment it doesn't have to be something super lavish that's in some building that you're have no control of never seen you can think about a neighborhood four neighborhoods down and Correct. watch watch the zip codes on zillow and the pricing and p- potentially locate a, a, a real estate investment 100 percent. and you're basically doing what the syndicators are doing they're looking around the country to find apartments or or offices or shopping centers etc that they can rent out and they get financing um, and and then they take a, they take they take a, a percent because they're offering you a service. Mm-hmm. If you could do that yourself, then you have more control, and you may even find a better deal because they're looking for scalable deals, right? Uh, they're not looking for, for for small small deals. It has to be scalable that that, that the business model works, and there's a lot of competition at that level. Mm-hmm. You could find residential housing. There's millions and millions and millions of units sold every year. All you need to find is one. If you find one amazing deal per year out of every Sunday, you're looking at 10. Mm -hmm. So out of the 500 deals, you need to find one that's a good value. Now, you still need to have some money, and you need to have some time. I'll tell you about the easiest way to invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the money to get into a syndication, or maybe you don't want to get into a syndication, there's something called the Real Estate Investment Trust, the REIT. And basically, these are 
people doing the same thing the syndicators are doing, but it's a public company that you can invest in. So instead of investing through a complex structure of a limited partnership and there's legal documents to be signed, this and that, it's in the form of a mutual fund. And they've done extremely well. They have a long-term track record. They've been around for 50 years. You could buy the same way you go into Fidelity and buy the target date funds we were talking about or, 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 or an, asset, uh, an asset allocation fund. You could buy a, a, a REIT index fund. They've made double-digit returns. Mm -hmm. Now, there's certain tax benefits that may accrue from a syndication that you're not going to find in a REIT. Um, a REIT also, you can hand pick, uh, I'm sorry, a syndication, you can hand pick. If you know that you have a friend or relative who's extremely skilled at real estate syndication, you can make much higher returns. But it goes the other way too. If you're just dumping money on some Chaim Yanko who happened to throw a deal at you, I personally think all things being equal, just at random, there's a fair chance you're going to end up in an in a inferior deal. By going to read index fund, basically you're investing in a mutual fund that can have 50 such syndicators that are, that, that are pooled into a mutual fund. And they went public, and now they're buying apartment buildings and, 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 and renting them out, and they're using the same type of financing. And they're buying shopping centers, and they're buying office buildings. The returns have been great. The only downside is, first of all, you don't have the exclusivity, that exciting feeling to, ooh, I'm with the big boys. I'm investing with the big boys. Mm -hmm. The other downside is you can see the pricing every day. So, for example, in 2008, what real estate was down. If you wanted to cash out of your syndication in 2008, you were bust because real estate nationally was down anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. And because of, and they and, and they have mortgages on 70, 80 percent of the value. So if the prices fell by 30 percent, all equity was wiped out if you forced a sale. Now, any good real estate manager knew, well, we're not going to sell. We're going to hold on. And hopefully they were able to. And most were, which is worked out. Real estate investment trusts, were, uh, their, their pricing is, is, is shown on the stock market. And real estate investment trusts were, were down 50 to 75%. So if you looked at your statement, you saw, I thought I had $100,000, right? I put in 50 mm -hmm. five years ago. Now it's at 100, and now it's down to 50. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will panic, and it's so easy to sell. You press, boom, sell. And now you just locked in your loss. Whereas in the syndication, everyone knew not to do that, and you didn't feel the panic to do it because mm -hmm. you didn't see the pricing every day. But in reality, you're investing in real estate, and you could put 10 bucks a month into this thing. So again, real estate syndication is a real business, and Baruch Hashem, like Charlie Munger says, Kleisel as a whole does it really, really well. But you don't have to be a high flyer. You could do really, really well. But first buy your own house, you get, if you have the time, you could buy another house. Mm -hmm. If you're in a very common, you're in an office building, try to buy your own office building, mm. whether the one you're in or one that you that you would theoretically want to move into. It's done all the time. Mm -hmm. Very many um, Hasidim in Brooklyn did extremely well when in the 1970s, when real estate in New York was horrible, they bought their warehouse or they bought their uh, their, their showroom or whatever it is. And they figured, why not? It was dirt cheap. And now those things are worth un untold sums of money. Amazing. But a real estate investment trust fund, if you're a modest investor, you want to get into real estate, you can do it. And it's been successful. Let's talk stocks. People walking down the block, they have a phone in their pocket. There are apps on there. Like you said, Robinhood, this and that. Very easy to buy stocks. I don't know too many people that haven't dabbled with Robinhood and bought a few shares of Amazon. And, you know, basically Jeff Bezos now reports to them. How should we be thinking about stocks? And is that there, like we already went through quite a few of them, there are many different investment um, opportunities. Is stocks something that an Orthodox Jew should be considering um, when he looks at his portfolio? So it's a great question. And there's three, there's three ways to invest in, in really any investment, but in stocks is where it's magnified. You could be a gambler. You're basically, you have no clue what you're doing. And basically, you're treating stocks like, like, like a casino where instead of you know, throwing a, a die or pulling a lever or, or playing cards, you're just throwing money into, into something. Maybe it'll go up. Maybe it'll go down. I personally, I don't understand that scuffically. You, you know, me, you know, we know that gambling is, not, is something frowned, frowned upon in the Mishnah. If you're using the stock market to gamble, then that's not, 
an endeavor that's 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 praised by Chazal. You could be a speculator, a trader, which is fine, right? We trade all the time, right? You have uh, right the people on Amazon, right? They find a product over here. Over here, it's priced at eighty dollars a unit. I could sell it over there for a hundred dollars a unit. They don't care what it's really worth. Is it worth forty dollars? Is it worth hundred forty dollars? I don't care. I'm making a spread. So somebody who is skilled at looking at trends, and he feels as soon as Elon Musk tweets, Tesla's going to go up 10%. He doesn't care what the real value of Tesla is in the long term, how many cars they're going to make, how are they going to compete with, with other, with other uh, established and new companies. They don't care. They're not long-term investors. They're traders. That's fine. But don't fool yourself. You may likely be a gambler, not a trader. Again, to be a trader, you have to have a real expertise in the market. The same way in Amazon, if you're buying your units at $80 and think you could buy for 100 but then you go sell it and you can only sell for 60 you're going to lose a lot of money. So you got to know the market. Again, I don't think the average person who has a job is able to be a trader. Then you, there's an investor, and that is where I'm a long-term partner in this business. So I got a call during 2000. Eight crash. Somebody was really panicked. It was a really scary time. Um, there was a lot going on, and a lot of that was reflected in the stock market. He wanted to cash out. That's it. The world's coming to an end. In general, he was very panicked. He, he I think he wanted to, I don't know, uh, buy, buy flour and rice and move to a, to a cave. I said, slow down. It's not the Tomorrow guy from the coffee morning. room, right? What? It's not the guy from the coffee room. No, different guy. Different guy. This guy is actually a very, very successful, wealthy person uh-huh. who's been around the corner. Right. But 08 was different. It, right. it really it, it really could have got, gone over the cliff. Uh-huh. I said, let's slow down. I said, tomorrow, the farmer who has the cotton and the wheat, do you think he's going to want to sell his cotton and his wheat? Yeah. Um, the guy who makes the socks and makes the bread, do you think he's going to wa- want to buy that cotton and wheat, and then sell his bread to Walmart or to uh, you know Wonder Bread or whoever whoever's going to be the next person. Yes, and then is Walmart going to want to sell those socks and, and loaves of bread? Yes. So why would you assume that Walmart stock? You're a partner when you buy shares to be a long-term partner with Walmart. You're a long-term partner with Walmart. As long as Walmart is growing their business, finding customers, competing well with the new entrants such as the Amazons of the world. You're a partner. The same way if you have a business and there's a slowdown in the summer. In the summer, we don't, we don't do as much business. You don't cash out. You don't panic because I believe in this business. You can be an investor in the stock market long term because when you buy the funds that I'm talking about, you're buying a little bit of Apple. You're buying a little bit of Amazon. You're buying a little bit of Intel. Intel now not doing as well as NVIDIA. Okay, fine. I'm going to have a little NVIDIA too. I'm going to let a money manager be a long-term investor, and that is 100%. The same way real estate. Real estate has intrinsic value. Why is real estate valuable? Because people always need a roof over their heads. People need a place to do their commerce. People need a, need a place to do their shopping. right? Even if shopping is switching from Walmart to Amazon, Amazon needs warehousing. Right. We're, 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 we're physical human beings. Until we all transfer to the metaverse, real estate has intrinsic value. Mm-hmm. So companies have intrinsic value too. Right. We need companies to do business. To be a long-term partner in companies is definitely something. But don't fool yourself to think that because you're playing around on your Robin Hood, that you, you're an investor. Very likely you're a trader who doesn't know what he's doing, or maybe even a gambler, which is not a way to make money in the long term. It's a hobby and, and not necessarily a healthy hobby. Gotcha. There was this message going around about some government bond guaranteeing 7%, and people were messaging me, it's a no-brainer, you got to do it. And then I looked into it, and it wasn't as simple. What's that all about, and is that something people should legitimately look into? Yeah, so so actually, I wrote about it when a couple months ago, when it was only at three and a half percent. That was in uh, I think March of uh, 2021. It's called I bonds. The I stands for inflation, and it's issued directly by the uh, by the government, by the Treasury Department of the United States. And absolutely, it really is. It really is a fantastic investment. You really are getting now the people who are bond, are, are investing in it. You're getting a seven point something percent return, guaranteed by the United States. That is impossible. I mean, think about what you're getting from a CD today. Mm-hmm. Um, almost nothing. 
So it's definitely a no-brainer investment. So what is the catch? Why isn't everybody doing it? There's one reason why people don't, don't hear about this is simply, like I mentioned before, there is an economic issue with financial advisors. Financial advisors can't really get paid to sell this product, and so you know they they they, they don't sell it. Um, you know they don't talk about it that much because it's not in their interest to. But it goes beyond that. First of all, very important: there's only there's a ten thousand dollar per person limit per year. So for some people, you know, especially people of means, um, they may not be as motivated if they can't dump in a huge amount of money right now. Then they're not motivated to do so. But for very many everyday people, or even people of means, you could do $10,000 for every person in your family. Now it's the end of the year, so you could do $10,000 for every person in your family for 2021, mm -hmm. and then January 1st, you could do another $10,000 for everyone in your family, So and it accumulates. So it could be a, it can accumulate to a real portion of your investment portfolio. Definitely a great idea. Basically, the best way to think of this, it's like a CD, because so, you're, not, you're not able to take the money out how within long? the first year. Within first the year. first year. You can leave it there for up to 30 years. And if you take the money out within the first five years, then there is, like a CD, a small ding on the interest. They take away a few months' worth of interest. But think about it. it it's still a no-brainer because even if they take away a few percent out of that seven, you're still going to be way ahead versus a one-year CD you would get in the bank. So really, it's a great product, and you have to buy it direct from the Treasury online. Um, there's actually an interesting twist. Mm -hmm. You can you can use it um, for education expense if you're beneath a certain tax bracket, mm -hmm. and then it's tax free. So you can get seven percent tax free, which is the equivalent of a regular bond of like a ten percent bond. Mm -hmm. There's even a way, and, and the rules are within the, 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 the Treasury's department. You could transfer it to a five twenty nine plan, um, which you could use for yeshiva tuition, etc. And again, use it tax free. So it's a, it's a great tool. This is something which is a good example where you got to self educate. You got to sure. learn about it. But it's a great product. Yeah. And while I listen to other podcasts, sometimes what I'll do is I'll pause if I hear a term. You know, you mentioned the five twenty nine. But if someone doesn't know what that is, just hit pause, Google it, come right back, rewind thirty seconds. You'll be in a whole nother place in terms of what you understand. What rate of return should people be trying to hit on a yearly basis? We mentioned three percent, seven percent. This one has one percent, point five. Regardless of what investments they're in, when they look back on the year, what rate of return should they be expecting? So it's a very, very difficult question. In a way, I don't even like the question um, because that's like asking how fast should I be driving on the street? It depends which street. It depends where you're going. And it depends on the weather conditions. So a short-term investor today I like that answer. is getting almost nothing. Because the weather conditions, which means interest rates, are at zero. There's nothing you can do about it. You know the only thing you can do about it? You can start driving at 90 miles an hour, which means you could buy, you could, instead of putting the money into a CD or into safe bonds, you could buy bonds from some you know, tiny company in China that will pay you 7% a year if they don't go bust and if the, the yuan doesn't change prices, et cetera, et cetera. But that, to me, that's like driving 90 miles an hour during the rain because you're in a rush. The market conditions are the market conditions. So that's what generally, to say how much should I want or expect. You should want the highest risk for a reasonable, the highest return for a reasonable amount of risk. Now, if you ask me historically, what's something that I can aim for or count on? So even there, there's a difference between long-term and short-term investing. But in, in long-term investing, I, I like using doubling your money over 10 years, which we discussed is about a 7 to 8% return. I think that's something that's reasonable in a balanced portfolio. You can aim higher. Let's say the real estate we discussed, even your own home. Historically, people who bought in New York um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, etc., and bought with a mortgage, many of them made 10 to 15% on their money steadily in a relatively reasonable way. So I, I would say 7 to 10% standard 10 to 15, if you're what Ben Graham calls the enterprising investor, is something I think is reasonable sh to shoot for. With the understanding, you, to a certain degree, you get what the market gives you. You know, you got to invest because you're, there's a good chance you're going to get much greater returns. Mm -hmm. And if you don't invest, inflation's killing you anyways. Right. So you got to invest. But if you're aiming for unrealistic returns, then you're probably going to get hurt. 
So this is the range that I think is reasonable to aim for. They say the best way to double your money is by taking the cash out of your pocket, folding it in half, and uh, yeah, fold it, right it again. Yeah, <laughs> right. um, speaking about cash, my brother Yaakov, cash money linger, did have a question. Uh, Yaakov, come on up, pull up a seat. My question is, how much money do you recommend the typical or average family should keep in cash in their bank account, in their wallets, etc.? I'm going to leave that. So when you say cash, I assume you mean like um, for emergencies and, uh, and, and yeah. contingencies. Yeah. So That's you have not your, tied up in an IRA somewhere. Right. So you have, you have money in your checking account to pay your day-to-day bills. Right. You have your investments, which could be short-term goals. You know, I'm saving up for a down payment or I'm going to make a bar mitzvah soon or longer-term goals. You know, I want to just increase my wealth, become financially independent, retirement. There's... Then emergencies crop up. Your van goes, your roof goes, your uh, someone loses a job, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a fantastic question. It's a vital question. The typical rule of thumb given is three to six months of, 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 uh, of household expenses, which if you think about household expenses in the firm world, that's, that's a pretty hefty number. Uh, many people would say, I'll never get to investing, or it will take me a long time to start investing if I'm saving up that much cash. The caveat I would say is the firm community has a tremendous amount of, of safety net. So whether that's family, whether it's a shul, you know, a rabbi fund, for, in a true crisis, um, those things will step up. So one could argue it's not as important to have a huge, hefty um, savings for emergencies because really we have, we have family for that and we have community for that. So you definitely don't want to have to call an emergency – Every time you need a thousand dollars, so if your fridge goes, that shouldn't become a communal emergency mm-hmm. where the rabbi's emptying is, is uh, you know is, sure. is, is is fun. So I would say less, but you know, so I would say from family maybe it's one to two months instead of three to six. There are those in their fifties and sixties. We do have um, I don't want to call them older listeners, but older than the average, right? Um, they're in a different stage of life than someone in their twenties and thirties. What should their investing goals be? How should people of different ages think about investing as it relates to risk and reward? So that's a great question, a very important question, actually, because, you know, when I mentioned about retirement and, and the trade offs retirement versus, uh, you know, if we're saving for Simchas, then how could I save for retirement, et cetera? Um, I believe that's true, that from families in the 30s and 40s that are, that are getting crushed by tuition and simcha bills should not necessarily be prioritizing, oh, what's going to happen in my 60s and 70s. But it's still very, very important. It's still very, very important. And when that really starts to crunch is in your 50s and 60s. I do think that's an example of, of, of a category of family that probably should get um, financial help, um, professional financial advisory help, as far as establishing a budget, as far as things start coming down, um, there's going to, you know, people in their 60s, there's going to be Medicare questions, there's going to be Social Security questions, there's going to be pension questions, even um, it's time to start taking money out of your investments. What's the best way to do that? So I do think that that's more than our regalachas. Um, generally, your time horizon is shorter, so you can't take as much risk. But on the other hand, those you need to start saving seriously. So very often, now's the time where simchas are starting to, to be in the back mirror. Hopefully your children are establishing their own independence. Mm-hmm. You really have to start thinking about your own future. Now's the time. If you didn't build a real nest egg, you really have to start thinking about that seriously now. There are those listening that are in a different bucket that they don't have a few hundred dollars at the end of each month to allocate towards some sort of investment. They don't even have a hundred dollars given the cost of Jewish living, a beautiful living. What would you say to them? So I would start saying, I get it. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very expensive. And the, you know, the, the cost of living for the from family is way beyond the median of, of a non from family. So I, 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 I feel your pain as a politician would say. I like I like quoting Tony Robbins, who uh, you know I'm not a big follower, but uh, you you know you can you can you're supposed to learn from everybody. So I heard him say a line. He was recommending ten minutes of meditation um, in your day, and he said such a such a something that really impacted me. He said, and if you can't find ten minutes in your day, then you really have something wrong. So I, I feel the same way to a certain degree. If your finances are so tight that you literally can't find even the smallest amount of money. 
to start some kind of savings plan, you really need a, an evaluation over here. Maybe you have to increase your income. Maybe you got to tighten your belt. Maybe you got to move somewhere else. But you're not going to, this is not a mahalach. You know, it's, you're going to have problems if you're that tight. Something's got to change. Closing remarks, right? Something you want to leave the audience with, and God willing, we'll be able to have you back for many years to come. Um, but something that helps you sleep better at night, something that keeps you up at night, I know, and we're going to do a whole episode on the Nishma study that recently came out um, comparing the different communities and, and expenses. What's something that's on your mind that you'd like to leave the audience with? So I would say two things. First of all, Baruch Hashem, investing today has become very easy. For us to say we cannot save, I often think of my grandparents who had a lot less, came with a lot less than I came with. Um, their parents could not help them at all. They came here with terrible uh, trauma. And they managed to save. So if, if they managed to save and build and invest, then we definitely should be able to. On a positive note, um, I heard this actually um, from uh, in different podcasts and different reports that talk about the cost of being from. And I feel, just like in every balance sheet, you have the the cost in every profit and loss. You have the cost side and the expense side. We're talking about the cost of being from. And I like talking about, let's not forget about the income side of being from. And I'm not just talking about the Ruchni side, which is immense. I'm talking about on the practical level. What's the value of having a community that will help you with gemachim and will help you get a job and help you improve your job? And these are things we tend to take for granted. We expect it. If Chaverim shows up in six minutes, why weren't they here in three minutes? And we you say, wait a second, AAA charges $300 a year for the service, and they're not even close to as good. Mm-hmm. So Chaverim's service is worth easily $1,500 a year. How much is that seller worth? Mm-hmm. How much is the, the, the communal net that kicks in in an unbelievable fashion, unparalleled, I haven't studied every community in the country or around the world, but I have a hard time believing there's any community as supported as our community. We're not a perfect community, but there's a huge income side to being from, and I'm very proud of it, and I enjoy it. Love that. Love that. Rabbi Eli Fried, my It's been Rabbi. a pleasure. Thank Take you, care. Eli. Thank you, Jacob. And there you have it. Investing 101, 102, and 103. If you have a question for Eli... Feel free to send it our way. Hi at livinglachaim.com. Sometimes I get mixed up between .com, .org. Hi at livinglachaim.com. We also have a WhatsApp. Let me pull it up. It's great. People voice note after the episodes. They leave their own podcasts in a voice note. Really awesome. Living Lachaim on WhatsApp. Make sure you add them. They have statuses. 914-222-5513. 914-222-5513. You will have statuses now. Um, Yaakov's active on Loving Lachaim on Twitter, on Instagram. Really cool stuff. Check it out. So if you have topics you want us to cover, guests, feed them. We're getting more and more feedback. It's out of control. People are now stopping me on the street and they're like, are you Yaakov Langer's brother? No. They're like, kosher money, I love it. Someone actually, Yaakov, came over to me today in shul, in the white shul in Farakway, and said, hey, because of you, I'm meeting Stacy from Achiezer this morning. Yeah. I stopped asking people what their name was. It's just, you know, it's too much. It's just, But if you want me to sign something, just mail it to me. I'll sign it. Really cool. Next episode, I don't want to give it away, but it's another cool one. Um, keep it coming. Until next time, keep your money kosher. The Kosher Money Podcast is hosted by Ellie Langer, run by Zevi Woolman, Ellie Langer, and myself, Yaakov Langer, and it is produced by Living Lachaim. For more awesome podcasts and shows, check out livinglachaim.com. Check us up on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Living Lachaim.